we are coming to this 41st chapter, and last time we left poor Joseph down in jail, forgotten, forlorn, forsaken. Poor boy. He's in a bad, bad way. And yet all of this is happening to him for God's purpose in his life. And this boy could recognize that. And if you and I could only recognize that today, it would give us a different outlook on life, I'm sure. Now in chapter 41, no, we're going to see Joseph is released from prison when he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh makes him overseer of the entire land of Egypt. And then he marries Asenath, the daughter of the priest of On, who bears him Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, this is a story here from rags to riches. I do not suppose that any Horatio Alger story is more thrilling than this episode in the life of Joseph. And now when we get to this chapter, we can certainly see clearly the hand of God in his life. Now, Joseph was conscious of this in the days of adversity, and it developed in him many virtues which are the fruit of the Spirit. And one of these that we mentioned before is patience. Tribulation or trouble worketh patience. Well, that was demonstrated in the life of Joseph. We find that this boy now is brought into the presence of Pharaoh, the Gentile king, just as later on Daniel is brought in before Nebuchadnezzar, both of them to interpret dreams. Now, what purpose of God now is going to be accomplished by the famine? The famine comes to the world. And the body said, well, what good could there be in that? Well, there's good in it, friend. God accomplished a very real purpose, and that was to get that family out of the land of Canaan down in Egypt and place them in the land of Goshen. That's one of the things. And I'm sure that in the lives of other people of that day, the hand of God was evident. And I think this is a chapter that you ought to read rather carefully, chapter 41 of Genesis, and note in the many ways in which Joseph is actually like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to be making that comparison from time to time. We won't have time, I'm sure, to do it today, but it certainly is something to recognize here and something for us to pay attention to. Now, poor Joseph, we left him in jail last time, forgotten. Let's see what takes place. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now that is back in chapter 40. And you remember the butler was put in jail. Then Joseph interpreted their dreams for the baker it wasn't good. He was taken out and hanged. But the butler was restored to his position. And Joseph had begged him to remember him and he hadn't. Now, Chapter 41, verse 1, it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Now, here is the dream of Pharaoh, and he dreams by the river. And it's, remember, two years after the last chapter, which means Joseph has spent two years almost in solitaire, just waiting there for something to happen, and so far it hadn't happened. Now Pharaoh has a dream, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat flesh, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. Kine are cows. And that's what we're talking now about cattle. There were seven that were very well fed, fine-looking cattle. And the others, they were really skinny cattle. They certainly were not very well fed. And Pharaoh woke up. And what did it mean? He didn't have the interpretation, but nobody could help him that day. And so the very next night, verse 5 now, 
And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. By the way, that's a whole lot of corn on one stalk too. The section of the country I came from, if you got two ears, you'd be doing well. And here, why, there's seven. Now, verse six, and behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And this would be more like it. In my country, only wouldn't be seven. There'd be two pretty thin-looking ears. Verse 7 now. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, was a dream. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them his dream but there was none that could interpret them under Pharaoh. And the butler was standing there. You know, that was his place before Pharaoh to get him anything that he wanted. And all of a sudden, the wise men are brought in and Pharaoh says, I've had this dream. Could you tell me the meaning of it? Seven fat cattle, seven lean cattle, seven full ears of corn, seven lean ears of corn. What is it all about? Well, these wise men said, well, that gets us. We don't have the interpretation for that one. Verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And I'd call it a little more than a fault. It's a sin for him to have done what he did. But you see, all of this is in the providence of God. These are what you call the fortuitous concurrence of circumstance. These are the things that happen that's difficult for us to understand at times. And why did they happen? Well, they happened for a purpose. And now the chief butler says, Oh, I just remember. I promised that young fellow down there in the prison that I would speak to you. And by the way, Pharaoh, he can interpret dreams. Now he tells Pharaoh his experience. Verse 10, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, Put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. We dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted to us our dreams to each man according to his dream. He did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us So it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. He said, well, we tried everybody else around here, and if that young man that's in prison that you'd forgotten about was so good at interpreting your dream and that of the baker, well, let's have him in here, because I, of the opinion that this dream was something very significant. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in under Pharaoh. Now, he shaved himself. You must remember that these people were not shaving in that day. This boy, Joseph, looked like the hippie type down there in prison, not shaved. But have you ever noticed all of the statues and paintings of the Egyptians? Clean-shaven people, they have a little goatee, many of the rulers, and that goatee was there. Actually, it, it was put on old King Tad. He couldn't grow one. It was just put there because it added dignity to the position of the ruler. But actually, they were clean-shaven people. And in this is a tremendous message, by the way. This man is lifted up out of prison. He's shaved now. A new line is before it. He's raised up. Resurrection is here. Now he goes to the Gentile. What a tremendous picture we have here. Now will you notice? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I've dreamed a dream, and there's none that can interpret it. And I've heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Now listen to Joseph again. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It's not in me. He makes it clear. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. In other words, 
from Joseph's viewpoint, God must receive the glory. And again, I come back to that. I said it the other day, the child of God in his life should be very careful that God gets the glory for any accomplishment or anything that he does. If you and I do anything, friends, and we're the ones that are doing it, it's of the flesh. And believe me, it's not pretty. And one thing is for sure, God won't accept it. But if you and I are doing anything that's accomplishing anything at all, it's because God is doing it. And in this particular case, Joseph says, it's not in me, I can't interpret it, but God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, I came up out of the river seven kind. And here we go with that dream again. We've already heard it. Will you notice verse 21? And when they'd eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. So I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. Now, that's the dream about the ears of corn. Actually, there are two dreams here, two separate parts of probably just one dream. It's treated, by the way, as one dream. Now, verse 25, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. Now, number one, the dream is one, one dream. Not two separate things, but one thing. Both speak of the same thing. And the fact it's repeated adds to the importance of it and the significance of it. And that's very important to see. And the reason that God has given it to Pharaoh is to let him know what he's about to do. Now, what does it mean? Here's the interpretation. Verse 26 now of the 41st chapter of Genesis. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and the ill-favored kind that came up after then are seven years. And the seven empty ears, blasted with the east wind, shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Now, will you notice, this is a prediction there's to be seven years of plenty, and then there's to be seven years of famine. Verse 32, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. This is something that is important, and God wanted Pharaoh to know about it. Now here is the advice of Joseph to Pharaoh. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet and wise. Set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that come. Lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. In other words, Pharaoh's going to get all the surplus now. It'll be at seven years of plenty. And all of that is to be stored. That is at least the advice of Joseph. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one, as this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according 
Under thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now, notice this and the significance of it. To begin with, this boy had been in the back of the prison, forgotten, forsaken, forlorn. Now he's brought out at the psychological moment because nobody can interpret the dream of Pharaoh. He does. And not only does he interpret it, Joseph, probably in his enthusiasm, and he was the man of ability, he makes the suggestion of what he's to do. And I think God was leading him in all of this, that in the seven years of plenty, all of the food stuff is to be collected. The surplus is to be stored away. The grain is to be put away so that when the famine comes, they'll be prepared for it. Now, it was a worldwide famine and severe because it even affected the land of Egypt. Now, Egypt is irrigated. The upper Nile, the blue Nile, comes down from Central Africa. Frankly, it's what Egypt depends on. They get just about an inch of rainfall a year and a good year. Well, boy, it's famine all the time as far as rainfall is concerned. But you see, the irrigation overflows the land, still does it. And it brings down not only water to water the land, but it also brings down a sediment that fertilizes the land. It does a twofold job. And now even Egypt was to be affected so that there would be seven years of famine in which the land of Egypt would be affected in a very definite way. Now, as Pharaoh listens to this, it makes sense. It's too bad that sometimes in the past we haven't had men in our government that had some sense of the future, of what was coming, and they no preparation for different things that have come. Our foreign policy, ever since before World War II, even from the days of when Hitler arose, has been more or less of a just a stopgap program. It's a first aid program. It's just something rushed in and it's an emergency. No foresight. No looking to the future. Someone asked Gladstone one time, what's the measure of a great statesman? What's the making of a great statesman? He says, well, it's one that knows the direction God is going for the next 50 years. Well, Pharaoh's given 14 years here, and he knows what's going to happen. Now, who could take over better than Joseph? And Pharaoh recognizes he's a man of ability. Now, don't you see God had been training him in the home of Potiphar? You wonder, well, why in the world did God permit him to go into that home? Well, he had quite a bit of training in the home of Potiphar, having charge of everything there. Now he's going to have charge of everything in the land of Egypt. This is a tremendous thing that's taking place, you see, in his life. Here he is next to Pharaoh, all the way from the back of the jail to the throne next to Pharaoh. I'm reading now verse 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, put it upon Joseph's hand. And by the way, that ring had a signet on it, and you put that down in wax. That's just the same as Pharaoh signing it, by the way. That's what he's doing. He's making him his agent. And he put upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, put a gold chain about his neck, and he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaph naph paaniah Now, friends, I like Joe better than I like Zaph Nath Peania. That was the name that Pharaoh gave to him. It's a Coptic name which means revealer of secret things. And he also gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. 
And this man now assumes this tremendous position. Now notice the age of this man because it's interesting. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Egypt. You see, he'd been in the land of Egypt now 13 years. Two of those years had been in that prison, that is, after the episode with the butler and the baker. So he might have been there a couple of years before. So you see, he'd been in the house of Potiphar for maybe almost 10 years. This gives you some conception of how the time had been divided there in the land of Egypt. May I pick up the thread of our story? Joseph is down in the land of Egypt, and he's had hard luck up to this point. He's now been called in to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, and he interprets those two dreams, tells them there to be seven years of famine, and there's to be seven years of plenty to precede it, and that during those years that Pharaoh should gather in all that he can in the granaries of Egypt, and prepare for the day that's coming. And so Pharaoh, he hadn't anyone better to put in charge of this than Joseph. And Joseph now becomes what would correspond, I think, to the prime minister of Pharaoh. Someone's apt to say, well, how in the world did this man get into this unique position? And why was it that Pharaoh was so willing to accept him? Well, primarily, Number one, God's with him all the way long. We've seen that. The hand of God, by his providence, is leading this man. As Joseph at the conclusion of Genesis says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's wonderful to know that. That's number one. But number two, there's also a very practical reason, by the way, And that is that at this particular period in the history of Egypt, there had come to the throne of the pharaohs the Hyksos kings. They were from out in the deserts. They were a Bedouin nomadic group. And for a period, they came in and took over the throne of Egypt. And they belonged to the same race, the same human stock, that Joseph belonged to. Actually, these Hyksos kings found it a little difficult to find in Egypt those that would be loyal and faithful to them. Now, that is one thing that characterized Joseph that we mentioned at the beginning. The fact that this man knew that God was moving in his life, it made him faithful, faithful to whomsoever he was attached, faithful to his task, because he knew God was in it and he was faithful to Pharaoh. So that explains the reason that this man found such a ready reception from Pharaoh at that time. Now, he not only at the very beginning proved his ability, but Pharaoh put this chain as we saw about his neck, which gave him the same authority that Pharaoh had, and then gave him for a bride the daughter of the priest of On. Her name was a Senet. Now, that means she who is of Neith, and Neith is a goddess of the Egyptians. In other words, she was an idolatress. That's what the name means, but Shakespeare said a rose by any other name smells as sweet, but he didn't call it Romeo and Asenith. Juliet sounded much better. And she evidently comes right out of heathenism, She is a Gentile bride for Joseph. And by the way, there's a parallel, is there not? We've said this man's more like the Lord Jesus, parallels him. The Lord Jesus is calling out of the world a Gentile bride today. That's the church. And Joseph had a Gentile bride. Now we're told in verse 46, and Joseph was 30 years old, when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now mark that down. He began his ministry when he was 30 years old. And I'm of the opinion you've already thought of the parallel to the Lord Jesus. He began his ministry when he was 30 years of age. 
And so Joseph took up his work yonder in Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, what is he doing? Well, during these seven years of plenty, why he's gathering the grain in, gathering all the produce of the land, because these are years of great abundance. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. In other words, there was a great harvest, a great abundance during those years. You'll recall that after World War II, we began to accumulate in this country a great surplus that created a real farm problem. If you rode the trains in those days, especially through Kansas and Missouri, Iowa, you'd pass bin after bin, silo after silo, literally hundreds, thousands of them, filled with grain that the government had stored. Great many people said, It is rather foolish to store that up. Now, if you go through that country today, you don't see that. You know what has happened? We've been sending it to the needy countries, and right now we don't have enough to feed the starving millions of the world. Someone has said that a 100 million people are going to starve, and somebody says, well, why not send them something? Well, the reason is we don't have enough now. That surplus is pretty much used up. And so a hundred million are going to starve. Our problem is, which hundred million is it going to be that we'll let starve in the next decade? Well, I don't know. But the important thing for us to note here is, during these seven years of plenty, and this seems to be the way the earth produces, especially since the curse of sin is upon it, seven years of plenty, and then... There are seven years of famine that came. Now he's gathering to gather the grain. Notice verse 48. He gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. See a good distribution, by the way. During the Depression, they were in lines to the soup kitchens in Chicago and New York. You are old enough to remember. I know as a boy I was in Chicago and those lines block long, fellas, young men in those lines. And they wanted something, some selling apples. Out yonder, stored up, there was an abundance even then. But the problem was distribution. That is, that's what they say, it, problem of distributing it. Well, what you have here is Joseph doing a very practical thing that he's laying up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up it the same. In other words, he's not only gathering together all this surplus, but he's putting it in areas for ready distribution. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. In other words, I tell you, Egypt was the breadbasket of the world. It's been called that. But under Joseph's management, it seemed to be two or three breadbaskets. Verse 50 now, And under Joseph were born two sons. So we have to pause for this little family note here. Before the years of famine came, which Asenath, and I'm glad that he's got her name down now, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. If you want to know, a good name would be Amnesia, but he made me forget. He was so busy down there, so much involved that he forgot about his father's house. And he'd been a homesick boy at first, but he's not anymore. Did you notice that I called attention to it last time, that it mentions the fact that he shaved, he arrayed himself. You say that's not a very important thing. Only the Gillette Company might be interested in that. Well, He shaved himself because the Hebrews wore long beards. And now 
that speaks to me a resurrection because he lays aside the old life and now he begins the new life. Now, and keep that in mind. He looks like an Egyptian from now on. He dresses like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He says, God's made me forget. So his name is Manasseh. And you can call him amnesia if you want to. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God have caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He's fruitful. And I've given these two boys two names, Manasseh amnesia and Ephraim that means fruitful ambrosia. Here we have amnesia and ambrosia. If you want the English of it, somebody says, well, that sure is free translating. It sure is, friends. But that's exactly what the two boys' names mean if you'd put it in English today. Amnesia and ambrosia. And now verse 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now, this takes you through the seven years of the plenty. Now, how old is Joseph now? 37 years old. Keep that in mind because I'm coming to something down here in just a few moments when we get into the next chapter. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. He was the one that had the bread. And again, I have to call attention to the parallel. The Lord Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And notice verse 56, And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came unto Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 41. Now when we come to chapter 42... Why, we see one of these dramatic incidents that is in the life of Joseph. In fact, I think you have here one of the most dramatic incidents in Scripture. The one that's ahead of this one is in the very next chapter, and we'll see that when we get to it. But here, why, we see now what the famine is going to force them to do. You say to me, you can begin to see the hand of God now. You sure can. But you must remember when Joseph was way back in that dungeon, he didn't see all of this, but he believed God. Here is a man, because of his faith, he was enthusiastic. He was always optimistic. Frankly, I wish my faith got that far down in shoe leather. Regardless of what happened, Regardless of what the circumstances are, I could be optimistic. I tell you, it doesn't take much rain, but just a few dark clouds to make me begin to become just a little less optimistic than I should be. I'm sure that's true of many of us today. Now this man's in this unique position. Now what's going to happen? I think you can almost see what's going to happen. The famine's over all the earth, and all the earth is coming to Egypt to get grain. Guess who's coming for dinner, friends? Well, I can tell you, let's get in the 42nd chapter and we'll find out. We'll see here that the famine forces Jacob to send 10 of his sons into Egypt to buy corn. Why did he send 10? Why didn't he send Benjamin? He didn't want to lose him, friends. It would have killed him to have lost Benjamin. And now we're going to have an audience, these boys are, with Joseph. And Joseph recognizes them, but they do not recognize him. Why? Several reasons. First of all, they thought he was dead. They were not looking for him at all. Just didn't expect to see him. He did expect to see them. And the second thing is, do you remember? He shaved. And how many years have gone by now? Well, let's put it like this. Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery. 
and it's now 37 years. So they haven't seen him in 20 years plus how many years they were in the famine. I don't know. Let's say two years. So they haven't seen him in 22 years. Last time they saw him, he was a 17-year-old boy. Now he's in his 40s. They don't know him at all, and he's dressed like an Egyptian. Call him an Egyptian. Now will you notice, verse 1 again. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? You see, they were looking at each other, doleful, not knowing where to turn or what to do. And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. By the way, this illustrates this matter of faith. A great many people say, Faith is so mysterious to me, and I don't know how to believe. I had a man in, and the fact of the matter is he didn't want to believe. How can I believe? Now, will you notice here how Jacob believed? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. He had heard something. He believed it that would bring life to them, and he acted on it. That's what saving faith is. Somebody says, how can I believe in Jesus? Can you imagine Jacob standing there before these ten sons and say, well, I've heard that there is corn down in Egypt, but how in the world am I going to believe it? Well, the way to believe it is act upon it. The Lord Jesus said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You hear something, you believe it. And that's what this man did. That's the way he got corn that brought life to them. That's the way we get eternal life, is through faith in Christ. Now notice, and Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Well, suppose mischief befalls the other ten boys. Well, they're older to begin with, and if you want to know the truth, wouldn't have hurt him as much to have lost one of them. Now will you notice, he keeps Benjamin with him, but he doesn't keep the others. He sends all ten of the others. Notice verse 5 now, and the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now we come to this dramatic moment. Will you notice it? And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now, Joseph has been watching for them. He knew they have to come. And there have been delegations there from all over the inhabited earth of that day. The famine was worldwide. And so he watches. Then, lo and behold, here come ten boys, ten young men. And they all bowed down before him and got right down on their faces before Joseph. Joseph looks at those boys. He knows them. You wonder what he thought of. By the way, what do you think of? Remember the dream he had when he said that your sheep will bow to my sheep? Well, here it's taking place. They're all down on their faces. Now, verse 7, And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. And the minute he did, believe me, he treated them rough. Why? Testing them. And you'll find out he's going to test them all the way through. But he made himself strange unto them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Notice his penetrating questions. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, you're spies, to see the nakedness of the land, you're come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We're true men. Thy servants are no spies. 
And he said unto them, believe me, Joseph is pouring it on. He says to them, nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. But he happened to be the one he is, not is not. He's right there before them. May I say this is quite a dramatic moment, is it not? And Joseph's not letting up on them. He's getting all the information he can from them. Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you of, saying, Ye are spies. And now he's going to give them a test. And he's going to find out as much as he can about his family without letting these brethren know who he is. Now he says for the third time in verse 14, Ye are spies, verse 15, Hereby ye shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. You see, they mention the fact that they are 12 brethren, only 10 are there. So they explain, they said, one of them, our youngest brother, well, he's not here with us. He's with his father. And our other brother, well, he's not. That is, he's dead. That's what they think about Joseph, they think really he's dead. And Joseph now is attempting to make contact with this youngest brother because these brethren are really half-brothers of his. And the boy Benjamin, he's now a young man, he's his full brother, and he wants to see him. And the way he does it, he said, you shall not go forth hence except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into ward three days. He locked them up in the town Bastille. And these brethren, I tell you, it looks bad for them now. And they wonder. Verse 18, And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. <laughs> now, if there was anything that would have given any inkling of an idea of who he was, this was it. He says, I fear God. Now, there were people in that day, and I couldn't prove this. My life depended on it. But there were many people in that day that apparently knew God, that they knew the way to God by sacrifice. That probably might not have excited the interest of these brethren or cast maybe a little suspicion about this man, but he at least gives a testimony for God. And I'd have you know that Joseph never misses an opportunity to give a testimony for God. And believe me, he's given a testimony here because he's going to give God the glory as the one who is directing his life. I would have thought this might have caused the brothers to suspect who he might be. It might also have encouraged them in believing that they'd be treated justly at his hand. And apparently this made no impression on them. It doesn't look as if it did. Now he says to them, though, verse 19, If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Now the thing is that these men, and that's what they are, some of them, I suppose, 50-some-odd years old. These men now find themselves in a real predicament, but they are being dealt with by one that fears God, but they are afraid because they don't know what he's going to do. So he has put on this sort of a proposition. He said, and it's on the pretext, that he's testing them to see whether they be true men. 
He says, now you leave one of your brethren here, and then you bring your younger brother next time or just don't come back. That's all. He said, that is the way I'm going to verify whether you're telling me the truth or not. Now, will you notice? They said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. So that what's taking place here is quite interesting. They're speaking in Hebrew, and Joseph, he understands him. But Joseph has been speaking to them through an interpreter. He didn't have to, but he did it because he is keeping up before them the fact that he's an Egyptian. And they do not think he understands. And when they are talking this over, Joseph hears them, actually, which is really a confession almost. Verse 22, now I'm reading. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not stand against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Now they feel like what's happening to them is revenge are the vengeance of God upon them for the way they treated Joseph. And verse 23, And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Now, the thing that happened was this. Joseph heard them, and he heard them how they now are repentant. (laughs) They really are. They say, this thing is coming upon us because of the evil that we did to our brother Joseph. And now Joseph hears every bit of it. And Joseph is moved toward them now. Really, he'd love to have walked up to them and thrown his arm around each one of them and welcomed them and called him my brother. But he dares not do it because he'd never get Benjamin down there now, and he wants to test them further. And we're going to see that a real test is coming up. Now they are going to leave one. They left Simeon. Joseph, when he was so moved, he had to go aside and wept. And then he washed his face and got rid of the tears, and he came in as if nothing had happened, you see. But he just couldn't refrain from weeping. So emotionally charged was he at this time. Now they leave Simeon, and you ask me why? I won't let you in on something. Don't tell anybody. I don't know. I don't know why they left Simeon, why they didn't leave some other one. And frankly, if they had left any one of the ten, I'd still have to say, I don't know why they left him. But this is the one that was chosen. I'd take it that while Joseph was gone, they made a choice, and Joseph accepted it. Now will you notice verse 25. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way, and thus did he unto them. He just couldn't refrain from not taking money from them at all. They fill their sacks, and the money they'd given him, he just put it back in the sack. And thus did he unto them. And they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he spied his money, for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. He said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it's even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? Now they recognize, you see, the hand of God in their life, and they feel like it's a judgment from God upon them. Now who listening in is going to say that this is not a judgment of God upon them? the thing that would ordinarily have been good news and would have been a wonderful thing. Would you mind going down to your, whatever your supermarket is? I was going to call one by name, but it might be just here in Southern California and you wouldn't know what I was talking about. 
or whatever your supermarket is in the place where you live. Suppose you went down there and got your weekend groceries in that you filled up two of these great big carts. And I saw a woman the other day buy that many groceries. And she had about three children with her. And I found out and just, you know, I remarked about the groceries. She had more groceries in those two carts than were left in the supermarket. And I commented, and she said, well, I've got three more at home. She had three with her and then a husband herself. That was a lot to feed, of course. But suppose you went down, spent $50 at the supermarket, and the bag boy got it all together for you, put it in the carts, and you went out and got in your car, and you found your $50 there at the top of one of the sacks. Would that be bad news to you? <laughs> Especially when you found out from the grocer it was just a little gift from him to you. But may I say to you, ordinarily, that'd be good news. In fact, that would be something that would be very encouraging. But it wasn't for these boys. They already feel like they're in hot water with this hard-boiled ruler down there in Egypt that's made it so difficult for them. Now they came unto Jacob, their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them. You might ask the question of why didn't they go back? What would you have done under the circumstances? I think they recognized they would have been in really hot water had they gone back. At least they thought they would have been, that this man would then accuse them of stealing the money. They are not taking any chances. They're going on home. And they intend to bring it back when they come back again because they felt like they'd be returning if the famine continued and it was to continue. Now we read in verse 29, And they came unto Jacob their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land, he spake roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren. Sons of our father, one is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true man, leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone, and bring your youngest brother unto me, then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men, so will I deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. Now remember, they've left Simeon down there in that land. And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid, and rightly so. They felt like that this was a trick, of course. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. And ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. <laughs> Poor old Jacob. He's not the cocky individual we once knew. He's not quite yet the man of faith. We'll see a little later, but he's growing. And he's not bragging now, but he's very pessimistic. All these things are against me. His son Joseph would not have said this, but this man did. Paul's going to say it even in a different way too. Paul's going to say all things work together for good to them that love God. He's going to say, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead, 
and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, this man, Jacob's life was wrapped up in the life of this boy, Benjamin. You see, Joseph was his favorite. He was the firstborn of his lovely Rachel. And now Joseph is gone. That was a heartbreak to him. And now here is the chance that he may lose this other son of Rachel. And he says, if this takes place, I'll die. And very candidly, he would have. His life was absolutely tied up in the life of this boy, Benjamin. He's the son of my right hand. He's my walking stick. I lean on him. And that's what he had been doing. And now he's to be taken from me. Well, Jacob says, I'm not going to let him go down. Well, poor Simeon is down there cooling his heels in jail. That's what he's doing. And Jacob says, I'm not going to let Benjamin go. 